Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. If you're able to, let's all stand together. We'll start off with that chorus. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful?
one more time.
Amen. All right, you can be seated tonight. Certainly we welcome you to our evening, excuse me, our midweek Bible study tonight. And uh, trust and pray you are looking forward to digging into God's Word together. Let me just make a couple of announcements and we'll move forward into our service tonight. First of all, thank you, Mark, for leading us in in uh, worship tonight. We appreciate that. Those choruses were a blessing. I love that hymn that you ended that with. That was, that was good. I enjoyed that. As far as announcements go, ladies, your Bible study is next week, September the 19th. So keep that in mind. That's Tuesday, and that will be right here at the church at 630. There is a sign-up sheet for that, and so uh, make sure you sign up if you haven't already. If you plan to attend, that's next Tuesday, the 19th at 630 p.m. Uh, this coming Sunday, I haven't announced it yet just because I was waiting confirmation, but uh, this coming Sunday morning, Brother Mark Thrift will be preaching for us. He's going to be in the service, and and he has yet to preach in this building, and so I gave him that opportunity, and he, he gladly took that, and he'll be preaching Sunday morning. Uh, for you that are new uh, and don't know, Mark Thrift pastored our church for 31 years prior prior to me, and uh, and is still a member here, he and his wife, Miss Joni, and they are traveling in evangelism um, all over the country, certainly all over the southeastern United States, but they've been as far west this year as Lodi, California, and, uh, and then, of course, of course, everywhere in between, really, but mostly southeastern United States, and he's taking international mission trips. He's going to preach Sunday morning for us. That'll be a real blessing. Um, and then uh, in October, there's a couple things going on. Sean Drew will be with us again. I believe that day is October the 8th, I believe. Is that what I told you, Mark? October the 8th. He'll be with us in that evening service um, later in the month of October. Um, by the way, Sean Drew is a singer. If you don't know, he'll be singing in the evening service. And then uh, the last Sunday of October, the 29th, I think this will be a real treat for us. Um, evangelist Tim Lee is going to be here. Uh, Tim Lee is a United States... A veteran, a Marine veteran. He lost his legs in combat in the Vietnam War. You need to look him up, Tim Lee. As a matter of fact, kind of an interesting tidbit, he is, uh, he is the president of the Board of Directors, Board of Trustees at Liberty University. He signed both of my degrees from Liberty and will sign my third one real soon. And so uh, Dr. Lee will be with us on October the 29th. And so that will be a tremendous blessing. You need to look Tim Lee up if you haven't. He is, he is a powerful, powerful evangelist. He's going to be very, very gospel oriented. He's going to present the gospel. You need to invite your lost family and friends here that Sunday morning, and uh, that will be, be a real treat for us. I mentioned Liberty University. Let me just mention this as sort of a prayer request. I present, have to defend and present and defend my thesis two weeks from today. And uh, so that's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, I don't know what to expect. Now, our, uh, our newest members here tonight, Ellis, is here. And he got me out of having to go to Lynchburg. So I appreciate that. Uh, because he was born recently, they're allowing me to do that um, virtually. So I'll be in my comfort zone back there in my study. And so that helps my feelings a, a good bit. But uh, nonetheless, I have to defend my thesis in front of a panel of seven or eight men, and, and that's two weeks from today. Um, so I appreciate your prayers. There's going to be a lot of long long days and, and late nights between now and then, certainly starting tonight. Uh, I'll be the, be the last one to leave tonight, I promise you that. You'll have to stay, you'll have to stay six or seven hours after the service ends to beat me out, to, you know, to stay longer than me. Um, but uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel as far as this degree is concerned, so... Appreciate your prayers. Hebrews chapter number four tonight. Hebrews chapter number four. We'll continue in our study in the book of Hebrews this evening. We've made it to the fourth chapter, and I want to deal with the subject of rest tonight. That sounds pretty good right now, doesn't it? <laughs> rest. I wonder if anyone here tonight is in need of rest. Good, godly rest. If so, I hope you'll pay attention to the word of God tonight because I think God has a, a word for you. Now, I have a very honest confession that I would like to make uh, to you this evening. A lot of times, I think, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. 
A lot of times I think I can preach the Bible better than I can live the Bible. Lori's probably muttering under her breath right now, amen. You don't even preach it very good either, but you certainly don't live it very good. Uh, today's text is about rest, and, and it convicts me to my core. Let me ask you a question. What, what would you say the opposite of rest is? Most of us would probably say work, uh, a, a doing something, because we think in terms of activity versus inactivity. But is it possible for a person to do absolutely nothing and yet still not be resting? Sure it is. Sure it is. Because real rest doesn't come from inactivity. It's not about inactivity. Real rest doesn't start on the outside and work its way to the inside. Real rest takes place on the inside of a person, and then it will, it will, the rest will be figured out. It will work its way out. What's the opposite of rest? more I think about it, I want to suggest to you and I tonight that the opposite of resting is what I call churning. You know what churning is, don't you? Churning involves those feelings of apprehension, anxiety, um, nervousness, worry, fear, uh, perhaps dread. Churning will keep you awake in the wee hours uh, of the morning. It will ruin your day by robbing you of your peace and your focus and your joy and your confidence, if you churn inwardly long enough, it can literally drive you to the brink of despair, drive you crazy. Now, I hate to admit it, but I will this evening, but, but I can be and lately have been a churning machine. Uh, I have been on vacations with my family when I was hundreds of miles away from the church. I didn't have any meetings. I didn't have any sermon prep. I didn't do any counseling, but I came back slap worn out. Why is that? Well, because while I was physically a long way from work, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, work was still going on inside of me. I was perhaps churning about a problem or a family or a person or a situation, and that happens all too often, really more than I would like to admit. So I'll be honest with you, this text is one that I desperately need. It's a message that I think I desperately need. And what you and I will find out tonight is that the only solution to that is rest. It's rest. When you are churning, you can't be resting, and when you are resting, I promise you won't be churning. We're going to see that God is very serious about his people who truly rest. He wants his people to be people who rest. And there's really only one source for this type of of rest, and it is found and given by God himself. The ancient church father, Augustine, rightly said this about God. He said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. And that's what this text is all about. And so we'll begin our reading in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. I'll tell you what you ought to do if you've got a highlighter or a pen or a pencil. You ought to as we read this, every time you see the word rest, you ought to highlight it. You ought to mark it. And uh, notice what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, <coughs> excuse me, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered in not because of unbelief. Again, he uh, limited a certain day, saying to David, uh, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered in his rest, he also has seized from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We'll stop our reading right there this evening. The word rest is used nine times in the first 11 verses. Now, anything that God says one time, pretty important. But if God says it nine times in 11 verses, then we better sit up and we better take notice of what he's trying to tell you and I. Don't you agree? Uh, today, we're going to look at three things when it comes to God's rest. Number one, the clarification of it. Number two, the invitation to it. And number three, the revelation of God's rest. And so, number one, notice the clarification of God's rest. Now, you got to go back in your mind a few weeks. Let me just play catch up for a moment to really remember why this subject of rest is so important uh, right here. you, you got to keep it in context with, with where we've been. Uh, remember why the book of Hebrews is being written. It's being written to who? To, uh, to these uh, converted Jews, Christians who are being persecuted because of their faith. They're being persecuted. They're, they're filled with pain, anxiety. He's given them a warning. He gave them one last week. If you remember, he said to harden not your hearts, to, to check your hearts. If you remember, I told you, I gave you a definition of a hard heart last week, and that is one that continually refuses to, to trust God when tested and, and obey God when commanded. Well, the spiritual rest that now the writer of Hebrews is talking about on the heels of that provides a protection from a hard heart. Go back to the opposite, churning. Churning is a sign that we're not trusting God. Churning is a sign that we're not obeying the commandments of God. Uh, churning is not going to lead to an ulcer. It'll lead to something far worse, a hard heart. And see, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that this godly rest, this internal rest has been modeled to you and I by God himself. Did you notice that in verse 4? He said, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Of course, that's a reference to God's work of creation. God created for six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Now, let me ask you a question. Was God tired? Did God need physical rest? No, 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 I don't think so. That would insult his omnipotence. The word rest here means satisfaction. Satisfaction in himself, satisfaction in his work of creation. Creation was his doing, and he was completely satisfied. Oftentimes we'll talk about the Sabbath. The Sabbath, work six days, Sabbath, seventh on the rest on the seventh. And the Sabbath is not about physical rest primarily. It's about spiritual satisfaction. It, is, it, it, it was taking intentional time on the Sabbath to be fully satisfied and be fully content with God himself. Now let's talk about three aspects of this uh, rest. Excuse me, two aspects of this rest. Number one, there's salvation rest. And that is that you and I have peace with God. That is internal. Uh, matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalm 62, 1, Truly my soul waiteth, literally, rests upon God, for him cometh my salvation. Truly, my, my soul, it finds rest in God because my salvation comes from him. Rest, satisfaction, peace, contentment in our soul. It comes when God's salvation floods in, when we have given our heart to the Lord. But, but what has to take place for that to take place? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 4, we have to cease from our works. We have to cease from our works, our efforts to justify our righteousness. Going back to what the writer's talking about, this is a part of the Sabbath. To remember that salvation has nothing to do with human effort and human works, that it is God's miracle. Now to keep it in context with what the writer's speaking of, you ought to write down Deuteronomy chapter number 5. Deuteronomy, matter of fact, if you'd like to, turn there, hold your spot in Hebrews, but turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 5, and notice verse 12. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. thought I was lost for a moment. 
Deuteronomy chapter number 5, and notice in verse number 12. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God has commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it. Thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that's within thy gates, that the manservant and the maidservant may rest as well. Notice verse 15. And remember, thou was a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand, and by stretched out arm, therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Now let me ask you a question. When the Israelites were rescued from Egypt, now back to Sunday school for a moment. When they were rescued from Egypt, what, what did they do to help God out? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Remember the last plague? Solution for it? Wipe blood over the doorpost and eat the lamb? Everyone was saved by the blood of the lamb, and everyone had the lamb in them when they were brought out of bondage. Now, does that sound pretty familiar to you? You're saved this night. You're saved by the blood of the last lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his blood covers your sin. It covers your, your death. He enters into you through the presence of the Holy Spirit, and so everyone today is saved by the blood of the lamb and has the lamb the Lord Jesus in them. We have done nothing and we can do nothing to save ourselves. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God, rest with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, probably the more well-known passage dealing with rest, says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friend, the, the, the gospel is the good news that Jesus has done absolutely everything necessary for your soul to have rest. And there's a lot of, uh, of mentally and emotionally and spiritually wore out people, exhausted people. They come up with a plan that sounds pretty good, a plan like this. They think, well, I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to do this and do this and do this. But what happens is they get more tired they're trying to get God's spiritual rest for their souls by doing more work, and it just doesn't work. Because real rest, peace with God, rest for your soul, can only be received, it cannot be achieved. You ought to write that down. Real rest can only be received, it can't be achieved. Let me ask you before I move on, when's the last time? When is the last time that you spent some intentional time, I mean really focused, Intentional time, just pondering and celebrating the fact that God saved you and God redeemed you. And it wasn't based on anything that you did, but it's based only on the grace of our God. There's salvation rest, that is peace with God. But then there's submission rest, and that is the peace of God. Now, Israel was miraculously brought out of Egypt. God chose Israel to be his people, but God also wanted Israel to choose him as their God. He wanted them to choose to believe him, to trust him, to, to, to obey his commands. Remember last week we talked about Kadesh Barnea. And once they got into Kadesh Barnea, they sent those, those spies in and they came back with a report. They came back with a report about the land of Canaan. Oh, it's awesome. It's beautiful. It's better than, better than described. It's land flowing with milk and honey, but boy, are there some giants in the land. We really don't match up real well. They had a decision. Would they trust and rest, or would they churn? And go back to our text in Hebrews, and notice in verse number 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Notice verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. 
course, he's talking about the Israelites. God put them in a situation, a situation where their circumstances, they could not change the circumstances if they wanted to. The only thing they could do is trust and obey God by moving forward into the promised land, or they could allow fear to come in and doubt to come in and control them and disobey God and just stay put where they were in Kadesh Barnea. Now, all of us face this. All of us face this. Of course, uh, the example that comes to my mind is, is, um, is, is, is fi financial. Financial. We'll face moments where we really can't change circumstances. We don't know how everything's going to turn out. We can either believe God, trust God, and obey God, or we can doubt God, refuse to trust God, and disobey God. And submission rest is not about knowing how God's going to work it all out. It's not about knowing all the details. It's just trusting God and having faith in God and submitting and trusting that he is going to work it out. A lot of people are stressed and worried. And again, the example that comes to my mind is finances. So relevant with our day and, and uh, people that are stressed over finance. You don't have what you used to have. Yet we know that as God's people, God's called us to give. To be cheerful givers, to, to be generous givers. And you, you know what he's called you to give to his church. You know what he's called you, called you to give to missions, to your, to your neighbors. But when you look around at your circumstances, all you see is giants in your life. You, you see all the things that can go wrong. And yet you want to pull back. You want to pull back. You want to disobey. And rather than continue to trust God and obey God in that area of life, because you know God's faithful, Instead, you're shrinking back, and you're pulling back, and you find yourself churning. And it's because of disobedience rather than trusting and obeying. And that's just one example. Of course, we can apply that to a lot of areas in life. And yet it's the peace of God and the spiritual rest that God provides. Friend, it's not about being able to predict the future. It's about trusting the heart of God and claiming the promises of God that no matter what I face tomorrow, God's going to be there to face it with me. Warren Wiersbe said the, uh, the ingredients to spiritual rest is hearing and believing. He said that equals resting. And I think there's biblical proof to back that up. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart Minds through Christ Jesus. Of course, I go back to Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Jesus said, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. And so the first part of this, this rest is salvation. The second part is submission. Here's our second point. And that is the invitation to God's rest. The invitation. And so we see how God has clarified this rest notice how he invites us to it go back to our text in hebrews 4 and verse 1 let us therefore fear literally what he's saying is is take heed he's be careful let us be careful and he says lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it so what he's saying is is let us be careful let us Fear the fact that we could potentially come short and not experience this rest. And so this place of rest is so glorious and it's so good that the writer of Hebrews says is that it ought to concern us when we come short of it or when others come short of it. You see, it isn't enough to almost enter into his rest. It's not enough. We don't want to come short of it. We want to experience it. Down in verse 11, notice, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, of course, of the Israelites. And so when it comes to resting, there's efforts, there's, there's work that you and I have to put in to enter in. We've got to make every effort in our life to hear God, to believe God, to trust God, to obey God. Now, we are not working in trying to figure out how to fix the circumstances of life, the situation of life. We're working to keep our eyes glued to Jesus Christ and submitting to his authority. 
And again, that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, and I will give you rest. You see, for some of us, this invitation to God's rest is believing the gospel. If you're lost here this evening, the invitation to rest for you is to, to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, to enter into salvation rest. But there's a crowd here this evening where there's a situation in your life. Oh, you're a Christian, you're a believer, God has saved you. But there's a situation you're facing. There's a, a circumstance you're facing in life that you are losing sleep over, that you're churning over. And God is calling you to be diligent, to hear Him, to trust Him, to obey Him, and stop trying to work it out yourself. Stop with the panic and stop with the fear. Be diligent to turn it over to God and then trust Him if you're His child. You know, a lot of what causes churning is pride. Pride. Pride says, I can handle my own problems. I, I, I'm a big boy. I'm a grown man. I can, I can handle this myself with a little more self-motivation, a little more effort, a little more personal endurance than, than I'll make it through the wilderness on my own. I don't need help. The Bible also says that pride leads to destruction. You and I have to make the decision to replace our panic and replace our anxiety and replace our pride with peace. We've got to decide to trust God and obey God no matter what the circumstances are and then take a stand in that rest and resist the temptation to go back to the panic, to the fear, to the anxiety, to the pride. The invitation of God's rest. Then notice lastly, and I'll close with this point, there's the revelation of his rest. Notice in verse number 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick. It's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, at first glance, it almost seems like the writer of Hebrews has kind of changed the topic. He's, he's, he's gone from talking about rest, uh, now he's talking about the Word of God. It almost seems like a topic change, but it's not. It's not. So how does the rest that God wants you to have connect with His Word? Well, in comparing the Word of God to a sword, the writer is not suggesting that God takes His Word and He slaughters the saints of God. It's not what he's saying. Matter of fact, in the Greek language, the Greek word here for sword does not mean a big sword like you and I would think about. It literally refers to a small dagger. And so God doesn't use that for slaughter. God uses that for surgery. And so the power of God's word comes into your life and in my life and cuts our hearts wide open with the precision of a master surgeon, and with his word, God exposes what is truly in my heart and what's truly in your heart, not to show God what's in there, oh, he already knows, but to show me what's in there. And I can realize just how vile and how wicked and how rotten and how nasty that I really am, and you can do the same. You see, God knows my heart far better than I know it. James says the word of God's like a mirror. I read this book, and it literally reads me. The Word of God cuts deep, and it exposes my sin, and it exposes my unbelief, and then I can deal with it. I can do something about it. The, the, the Israelites had a big problem. They had a problem of judging God's Word instead of allowing God's Word to judge them, and it got them in a lot of trouble. They turned away from hearing and believing and obeying God's Word. Therefore, they did not enter into the rest God had for him. I told you last week that the journey to the promised land, 40 years, it was only intended to be a few weeks. And yet because of unbelief and not entering into the rest that God had for him, that journey turned into 40 years. And the same is true for us. We forfeit a lot of blessings in life and a lot of good things in life because we churn. Because we churn. Because we don't enter into the rest that God has for us. God uses his word to enable me and you to see sin and unbelief. And, and if we'll hear it and believe it and trust God in it, then the word of God then enables 
my heart and your heart to obey God and claim the promises and the principles that he's given to us in his word. And that's why every believer ought to be diligent to apply what you hear from God's word to your life because it's in the word that we see God, but it's also in the word that we see how God sees us. And then we can obey and we can do something about it. I was looking for a closing illustration and I ran across this. Uh, of course, the, the idea of traveling you know, to outer space or other planets, that, that's really not that far-fetched in today's world. We, we see, people, see people talk about it all the time. And, and, uh, but back in the beginning of the 20th century, space travel was only a dream. And then the Haddon Planetarium in New York City as a joke put out an advertisement inviting people to make reservations for a trip to the moon. Now, this is in early 1900s. Put out this advertisement for a trip to the moon, and within two days, over 80,000 people had responded. Again, this is a joke, reserving a reservation for a trip to the moon. Psychologists poured over the applications. They discovered that the primary reason people wanted to go to the moon, I quote, was to escape the stress and responsibilities of everyday life. In fact, one woman said this, it would be heaven for me to get away from this busy earth and just go somewhere that's nice and peaceful and safe and secure. I want to say, ma'am, have you ever heard of the beach? <laughs> you don't have to go to the moon for that, but I think we can all identify with her, can't we? What that woman was really longing for, without saying it, was a true place of rest. And what she doesn't know, that you do know, is that that cannot be achieved. That has to be received. And that can only come through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's his rest. It's his rest. Matter of fact, there's plenty of evidence in 11 verses there that God expects his children to be rested people. Amen. Close our study there in Hebrews chapter 4. This evening we'll pick up, Lord willing, next, re next week right, right there with verse 14. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Good to have each of you here. Good to have each of you here tonight. And I trust and pray that you've got some help from our Bible study this evening. We'll look forward to Sunday. Again, Mark Thrift's going to be preaching uh, Sunday morning for us. And, and then Sunday night we'll be right back in the book of Romans. But Brother Mark will preach. Uh, Sunday morning. If you hadn't heard Brother Mark Thrift preach, then then uh, buckle up, buckle up. He's going to do just that. He's going to preach. All right. <laughs> you'll you'll leave with a clear understanding of the difference in preaching and teaching. All right. He's going to preach. Amen. He's tremendous, a great expositor. You'll you'll love it. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Uh, Michael Hatley, pray for us if you would.